first thing what I'm going to show you is, uh, is a demo of uh, my super website. I call it the next TripAdvisor. You'll see very soon why. Um, then we're going to go through, you know, some stages of DevOps, and we're going to see where you are at and what you can improve. And as we go along, I'm going to share some tips and tricks. And most of the time, we're going to spend at, you know, what is the next stage, how you can actually get even better at doing DevOps. So uh, my name is Daniel Malik. I am a solution architect at SSW. Uh, I'm also uh, a Microsoft MVP for Visual Studio and Technologies or something like that. The name is so long that I always keep forgetting. I, I used to say Visual Studio ALM, but that's a subcategory. And DA yeah, doesn't apply anymore. Um, I, but anyway, I love doing everything related to Visual Studio Team Services or TFS, and I love Azure. These days, I'm doing a lot of work on Azure, and I tell you, it's super great what you can do with Azure. So a lot of session to that today is going to be related to what you can do in Azure. Um, probably by now, you notice that you know I'm not an Aussie. At least my accent is not coming from here. Um, this is where I come from. So how many of you have heard about Slovenia before? Yeah, yeah. Oh, half the room. That's great. So yeah, for those of you who don't know it, what if I mention Melania Trump? Does that ring a bell? OK. Well, thanks to, to her, we at least got on the map. So that's a good thing. All righty. So this is my super cool website. Uh, super cool website. Um, it's hosted on ddcsydney.azure.dev. Oops. Maybe I can show you that website live. It's here. So it's hosted on DDD Sydney. Um, that's where it was presented for the first time. AzureDevOps.xyz. Uh, by the way, I didn't know you can buy XYZ domain until I had to buy one. And that was the cheapest one I could get. So um, apparently, you can do that as well. So this website, you know, as I call it, the next trip advisor, can do some powerful things for you. So, like, um, what country would you like to go to? Oh, there we go. Very good choice. So now it's measuring the distance, and that's the distance from Australia to Slovenia. Uh, any other country? Like the other day, someone mentioned Mars. So let's see how far Mars is. And it can measure that as well. Apparently, it's closer than Slovenia. How about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So, huh? Yeah, well, I don't know. This is a live thing. So what it does in the back, it goes to, uh, I think, distance two. And then it works out something like that. So it does callbacks for you. And then it parses the information and presents it. Um, this website obviously has, hasn't heard about uh, the API before. But Mars is probably somewhere in Kazakhstan. Looks like that's where Mars is. There we go. So. <laughs> Uh, so this app is hosted in Azure. And you will see that um, the way it is configured, that there's a classic website you know, running on a platform as a service. That website has a custom domain set up in the back. And that's how I actually you know, can access that website if I hit that URL. Uh, the way this also works is my DNS records have been changed so that I'm running a private DNS in the cloud. Uh, the reason being is that I can you know, make on-the-fly changes if I have to. So if I'm you know, moving things around, there's no downtime and a few other things. So this is my private DNS that I'm using. Uh, by the way, how many of you are using private DNS like this before? No? OK. Um, like I said, the main benefit is that the, any changes that you make, they are instant. So well, it comes down to you know, how you set your TTL. but. Um, it's pretty good because you have everything in one place. So if you're hosting websites, the DNS is, I won't say super cheap, but it's uh, reasonably cheap. I don't know how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests you get for free. or, um, But it's definitely worth having it rather than you know using some other DNS. And because it's, uh, it's global, it runs across all data centers, um, it will redirect it to the right region re regardless of where you are. So yeah, super cool. So this is how my website is configured. Um, that DDD Sydney record points to uh, an Azure website, and that's how the whole thing is hooked up together. So what I want to do, you know, that blue color that you're seeing here, uh, where did that go? Oh, here it is. So that blue color, I think that you know, it's nice. But if I, you know, made it red, that would be the best-selling thing ever. So. 
you know, a couple of months and TripAdvisor can go. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a simple change. I want to change that website to point to, well, to, to make the background red. And um, I actually made that change to, to save some time. So let's have a look at my latest build. So the build is already configured. What it does, it pulls down um, the source code. Then it you know, applies the Git versioning. So I'm using semantic versioning, super easy. Um, and then I run the, the .NET Core commands to restore, build, test, and publish the package. And the whole thing goes up in an artifact, which is later deployed via release management. So if I trace it back to what my last change was, um, there's this um, commit. And what I've done, I've changed that Australian blue, whatever is on our color flag now. Uh, I've changed that to red. So once I run the uh, deployment, all I'm expecting is that this background will turn into red. Okay? So, and then I'm going to guide you through what exactly happens in the back, how I deploy, and so forth. So let's kick off that release. So I have a release definition here pre-configured. All I'm going to do, I'm going to hit release. And then I'm going to choose the latest build, which is exactly the guy that you have seen here. So with this one, I'm going to hit create. And we're going to let it do some work. And we're going to return back to our slides. OK, so version 2 uh, is up you know, for deployment. Now we can go through a few stages of DevOps. So what stage of DevOps are you at today? So there are like four, not stages, but more like categories. And inside, you know, people are doing, you know, some things from that category, not everything. Um, so let's see what do you do. So when you start a new project, um, you normally get us some requirements, then you plan the work, you manage it, you know, you're using tools like um, VSTS uh, work items or Jira or Raleigh and you track your progress as you go. So how many of you are using any tools like that? OK, most of the room. So who's using Jira? Ooh, half the room. Who's using VSTS? OK, about a third. Who's using Raleigh? No one. OK, so VSTS and Jira are the, the most used tools here. Um, so you plan sprints and things like that? Yeah? OK, sprint reviews. Great stuff, good. OK, so then we get to the, to the next stage where you, you know, write some code, uh, do some unit tests, um, put everything in version control, run the build, and you know, eventually that produces a package. So how many of you are you know, doing that? Who's using the continuous integration? Oh, only half the room. Wow, that's a bit scary. Um, anyway, so who's writing unit tests then? Oh, most of you. That's great. Good stuff. Um, how about technical debt? Th there's a green line that I put in, in this slide. So how many of you can analyze your technical debt? OK, what are you using? SonarCube. Sorry? SonarCube. SonarCube. Very good. So SonarCube is one of the tools that can analyze how good your code is. And um, before I jump into that, let me ask you a question. Who's using Git? Half the room. Who's still on version? Well, Team Foundation version control. No one. Oh, great stuff. It's not that it's bad, but you know, Git gives you you know much nicer features, and uh, most of Microsoft's investment is now in Git anyway. That doesn't mean they're not going to bring Team Foundation version control to the same thing, but Git is having priority, and um, it's better to be on Git these days. So, if you're using Git, are you using pull requests? Who's using pull requests? Yeah, why not the rest? Pull requests are super awesome, and there's one reason why. You can set up a build on every pull request, which means that now we come to SonarCube. So when you run a build uh, on pull request, you can capture the information of how good that source code that's coming in is. So on your pull request build, you can set some quality gates, and you can say everything that fits inside SonarCube tags 
like in, in a task, uh, in a build definition like this one, validate every change that's coming in. And if that's not suitable, reject the pull request. Because if the build doesn't succeed, then you're not accepting those changes in. And that's an incredibly powerful feature. So imagine having your code. You don't know what you inherited. But you don't want your technical debt to go up. You want to keep it as is or slowly reduce it, right? And if five or 10 different people are working in a team and they're trying you know, their best to, to get that code better, you never know at what level you are if you let people just you know, submit a pull request and then that, that is accepted automatically. But if you set some quality gates on your pull requests, that will eventually help you get your technical debt down. So that's why SonarCube is so good. So it's great that you're using it. Set it up on, uh, on a pull request build, and you're going to get some fantastic results back. So this is what you get um, as part of SonarCube um, static analysis check. And it works across C Sharp, Java, JavaScript. I don't know what components are exactly paid. You know, not everything is for free. Uh, but a lot of stuff is. And it, what it does, it goes through your code, scans for your changes, and works out you know, how many issues. And it comes back with a report, like you know, how many minutes of you know, technical debt have you incurred. Like if there's a change that you have to fix and it takes five minutes, that's going to be there. If it takes two hours, it's going to add up. And then that's how you work out how much technical debt you have there. So it's a pretty powerful feature. And eventually, you know, if com it comes back with some good results, it says, yeah, OK. Otherwise, you know, it rejects the whole build and things um, you know, are rejected at that stage. OK, release. How many of you are using any automated deployments? OK, third of the room, scary. How many of you are deploying manually? OK, that's even more weird. How many of you are deploying at all? OK, at least we're <laughs> we have hands working up and down. All right, so when you're deploying, do you run any automated testing as part of your deployment? Ooh, out of the room, great. How many of you are doing some load testing as part of your deployment? OK, nice. Now, how many of you? construct the environment before you actually deploy to. So you construct the environments on the fly. Well, the oh. <laughs> Good stuff. So what I'm talking about is when you're deploying your website, you're pretty much running on a ground where everything has been set up for you. But what if you start with a zero-based infrastructure and you don't know where you'll be deploying to? Like you know, deploying um, a website into a pre-created environment is easy. But if you want to run like unit tests or integration tests or some load tests and see how that website is going to perform in um, real life, you can construct your environment on the fly, dump your website into that one, run some heavy tests on that one. Once it's done, you take that environment off, and then you continue your deployment to production. How cool is that? Yeah. OK, I'm going to show you some of that stuff today. Um, and we're going to be there pretty, pretty soon. So um, who's using uh, release management? Or did I ask that question already? I think I did. Anyway, so this is how release management looks like. Um, it's, a, it's a nice UI, if you ask me. But then again, it comes down to preferences. Uh, some people prefer Octopus Deploy. And yeah, both of them are pretty good platforms. Now, automated testing, um, does anyone run Selenium tests to test their UI? OK, two of them. Why? Uh, these are functional tests. So earlier in the pipeline, we had those unit tests that we, uh, the developer writes, right? So these are the functional tests. So Selenium tests we need to, again, after deployment, we need to run. So these are before deployment at the time of compilation of your code. But Selenium <coughs> tests, after you're deployed, you again need to validate UI paths and everything. OK, so let me paraphrase you know, for people who are watching this um, session online. So the answer was that he's running some uh, unit tests, and the, the Selenium tests are functional tests, which are running you know, some things on the UI. Now, are you, are you building any Angular apps or anything like that? Yeah, somewhat. OK. So with Angular apps, things become a bit more tricky, right? And um, 
the problem that I see, and this is where we not abandon, you know, in total uh, selenium tests, but, you know, to maintain those tests, it becomes incredibly expensive. And um, th there is like a, a threshold where you say, I want to do, you know, some certain features to test them as part of my deployment, like a login screen, you know, you want to work out if th those things work uh, after you deploy. But uh, for the vast majority of um, the UI, it doesn't make sense to, to test it anymore, just because, you know, if things are changing so quickly, and especially with Angular, when you have to wait for components to load, it's really, really hard to do that. So if you ever consider running Selenium tests, keep in mind that, you know, it's probably better to spend that time on, you know, functionality rather than the UI. If you do the integration tests up to the UI la layer, so that the web API works as expected, um, it's better to do some static pages only here on, uh, on Selenium. Um, so load testing, uh, has anyone tried Azure? Oh, there's a question. Uh, I haven't tried that one. So the, the question was, uh, what's the tool again? Protractor. Protractor. Okay, so... A Still recommended one for Angular. So oh, okay, I, I haven't tried that one. So uh, the question was, is it Selenium not good only for um, Angular? Or are we recommending anything else? So I haven't tried that one. Most of the time, our guys... They are running some unit tests inside Angular to test the components themselves. But as I remember, they are not running anything on the UI to click through that one. So if you, if you can do unit tests in Angular itself, that, that's great. I don't know what that tool gives you. Uh, if it runs that you know, through the UI for you, then great, yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to you know, what value do you get. I always you know, ask people, if you have, you know, a limited amount of hours, regardless of what you know the total cost, then it's going to be where you're going to spend that. Because don't forget, DevOps is all about providing business value. It's not about tools. Tools enable you to do certain things, but it's not about you know oh, I'm running this and that and X Y Z. It's all about the business value. And if you can do some, if you can <coughs> do some quick wins with that tool, then great. Yeah, I would, I would definitely encourage you to keep doing that. Uh, but if that is taking you quite some time to do it, then you have to reconsider, am I providing the business value to my product owner? And if I'm not, why should I be keep using that, right? We tended to focus on, because we're making quite complicated SPAR applications, and so we're carrying significant complexity on the front end. Okay. So as a result, it's not just a simple facade onto the web API, it's actually doing that the components become more complicated because they have longevity to them, not time. Yeah, OK. So, so let me paraphrase for the people on, uh, on the live stream. So the comment was that uh, you're building some quite complex SPA applications. And because of that, you need to work. It's worth investing. That's right, yeah. So probably as a rule of thumb, um, I would say it's almost like you know with insurance. When you have something that is worth $10, and you're paying eleven dollars to, to insure that one. That's where you know you're actually spending more than what the value is of what you're you know protecting. And in that case, it's probably best you know to, to stop investing in that area. Um, but if you're, you're spending you know four on what is worth ten, then yeah, you can keep going. So that, that's what my answer would be to, to ha what to invest into. Um, one of the other things that you can do here is uh, Azure load testing. Have you tried that before? OK, so if you spin up your website, and if you want to do some smoke tests, like you know, your website in production has thousands of users, or hundreds, whatever. If you want to work out you know, if there is something <coughs> problematic, uh, it's better to do some smoke tests before you actually hit production. So maybe spin up a staging environment on the fly, run some tests, see how the website performs, if you have any issues, and so forth. And that's what Azure load test is great for. So you can get it there, uh, just give it a try. OK, finally, we come to the monitor and learn um, stage, which is, are you using any application um, monitoring platform, App Insights? 
Okay. App Dynamics. Okay. Uh, New Relic. New Relic. Okay, good. Uh, is anyone using Raygun? You're a Kiwi. You should know that product. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me guide you through a few of them. So this is what the App Insights um, looks like. You. Um, you can go through a few components in here. Uh, you can see performances, fail requests, you know, how many concurrent users, things like that, what, what's the average load time, and so forth. So it gives you, you know, nice out-of-the-box functionality. You can enable that uh, in Visual Studio straight away. So when you create a new web app, it's going to ask you whether you want to have App Insights or not, and you can, you know, tick a checkbox, and it's going to add that for you. You can also enable that afterwards. So if you go to Azure Portal, and there's a web app sitting in one of the um, platform as a service um, components, you can say, I want to enable App Insights on that one, and it's going to give you exactly the same functionality. OK, so next one is New Relic, just a different, well, maybe the screenshot is a bit old, but um, just a different flavor of uh, what your APM uh, is. Then we come to Raygun. The reason why I like Raygun so much is it aggregates exceptions for me. So it's probably the best crash platform that I came across. Um, it does aggregate exceptions. Um, I can, you know, almost do like a backlog planning where I can go through the list of issues over there and I can say, okay, this one is, okay, is has been fixed. I want to mark that as resolved. And until the next version comes in, it's not going to complain about it because I resolved that one. The other thing about uh, that's really nice about it is if you keep versioning your software pretty well, it's going to figure out in what version um, a certain bug crept in. So you can immediately trace it back to a certain version number in, in build and then work out, ah, oh, this is where something went wrong. This is where I have to fix it. So it's a pretty powerful platform. Um, give it a shot if you, if you can. OK, uh, there are a few more things in here. So how many of you have heard about Chaos Monkeys before? OK, half the room. Uh, Chaos Monkeys are you know, just one bit of what Simeon Army is. And all they do is pretty much random things to, to your server or your platform. So like turning on and off uh, certain ports, uh, taking servers down and so forth. And the, the whole point about Simeon Army is that um, it, it tests how good your system is when it has to recover from an unknown state. So pretty much it's producing a failure on the fly for you and sees if your system can recover from that. So Netflix introduced that in 2012. Um, and a lot of you know, big companies are doing that on the fly as part of their deployment. And they're, they're doing that on their live servers. It's not like, oh, I'm doing that on the test server and see if it comes up. They're doing it live. They want to see how, what, what happens there. Which product uh, do we have for this? Uh, I don't think that there's a product that would do that for you on the fly. Um, it's, it's not that easy to, to, you know, because you have to work out what exactly you want to do. So it's more like a concept than a product. Um, <coughs> I want to randomly, you know, turn off machines. Uh, how do you respond to that, right? So yeah, maybe there, there is a product that can do that part. Uh, I never tried this one. For us, it would be way too expensive to do that. But if you want to keep pushing it out, what you can do, that's um, definitely one of the, the ways to go. All right, um, the final bit is the test and feedback extension. Are you using any test and feedback ex clients so far? No, OK. There was one in Team Foundation that was pretty old and dated. And um, eventually, they re replaced it with a nice and modern uh, client like this one. It lives inside Chrome as an extension. It also works in Firefox. And Microsoft Edge is coming. Um, and the reason why I like it is I can go and I can create an like, um, exploratory session. And I can click through the website. And it's going to you know, follow the trace. Well, pretty much it's going to get a trace of what I've been doing, uh, where I've been clicking. It can take screenshots for you on the fly. And once I hit Submit, it's going to uh, pull my stats from my OS and my browser stats. And it's going to submit everything back to me. So as a developer, when I have to go through some information and see where the bug was, it gives me pretty good insight into what has happened on the client's computer. All righty, so um, that's, yeah? Just that, that was a free tool in Chrome, or? 
Uh, this extension is free, but if you want to use it, you have to uh, purchase, I think it's test and feedback extension on VSDS. It only works with Team Foundation version control and Visual Studio Team Services. It doesn't work with anything, any other Git like GitHub or um, other others, yeah. So, um, but it's still, if you, you know, like most, vast majority is using VSDS, so give it a, give it a try. Alrighty, this brings us to what is actually the next step. So we went through a lot of things today, uh, and I want to show you the next one, which is infrastructure as a code. That's what I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's have a look at this website, if the deployment has finished. <coughs> so let's hit refresh. Okay, so the deployment has finished, which is good. So let's go to this website. Hit refresh. So hopefully the color has changed. Oh. <laughs> the color hasn't, but the country has. I think it must be the CSS, CSS cache. So let's try that again. Okay. Let's try this guy. Yes, yeah, so the color has changed, but how on earth did that country come up there and uh, even the destinations have changed but the data is still there so what we're going to do here I think it's probably best if we do some reverse engineering so let's go to the website um, itself and see the code to work out what has happened so this is the CSS that's the change that I made in that build and that's my index file. And what it says, it's, okay, so this is, is awesome. It goes to website location. Okay, where does that come from? So if I go here to my home controller, and if I search for this guy, okay, I see there is something in get website location. And it reads that from app settings. Okay, let's go to app settings. And the website location is empty. Okay. Is it picking up from the, uh, the settings done in Azure somewhere? So we're going to get settings? we're going to get to that part very soon. Yeah. So that website location it's not coming from here. And if we look at the code here, down here, get website location. So if that data center, whatever settings it was, yeah. if that is empty, it's going to return default to Australia. So if it's West US, it returns United States. Can you make the text a little bit yes. So now we need to work out how did that setting get to set to West US, because obviously this drives the change up here. Okay, so let's go to uh, Azure portal. Is that big enough, or should I make it bigger here? Is it visible? Yeah. Okay, let's make it a bit bigger. So this is what my website was before. Now, obviously, I want to check my DNS records because we know that cloud is immutable. I can't just, you know, rename the website and it's going to still point to something else. So the only thing that could have changed is my DNS record, unless the website was deployed somewhere else. So probably the best place to look into is my DNS. Now, before it was set to DDD Sydney, uh, 2017.azurewebsites.net. Now this guy, well, it points to a traffic manager. Okay, so what is that traffic manager? It's this guy <coughs> here. And as you can see, this guy still has um, an endpoint configured to be DDD Sydney 2017. But there's another one that's something that we didn't have there before. So what does Traffic Manager does for me? Um, imagine having a website and you want to you know, migrate it on the fly without losing any data and having no downtime. Traffic Manager reroutes, well, it's not really a router, but it works out what are my available endpoints. So if I have my website, you know, living one instance in Australia, one in the US, as soon as I hit that website somewhere from somewhere in the US, it's going to redirect me to that one. And if I am in Japan, 
it's probably going to redirect me to Australia. It really depends on which one is the closest. And you can configure Traffic Manager to be doing heaps of things for you. So the reason why I used it here is when I deployed my website, <coughs> I had an existing website up and running. And I wanted to spin up a new infrastructure on the fly so where I can deploy my version 2. And I'm going to come to that part in a minute. But if I wanted you know, to, to keep my website up and running, I needed to have something that is going to redirect me to the right website as soon as I you know, uh, deployed the, the new version. And Traffic Manager was the best thing for me to do. So if my DNS is sitting somewhere here in the front and my website is right behind, I need something in place that is going to redirect me to the right guy as soon as I hit the web page, right? So Traffic Manager, as soon as I you know, created it, was um, I added another endpoint in the end, that's the first one, which pretty much just uh, served as a proxy to my website. So as soon as I hit that ddd.sydney.azuredevops.xyz URL, it went to Traffic Manager, and Traffic Manager redirected me to, to my website. Now, eventually, we ended up with a different website, and that endpoint that I had before got disabled, which means that once that website came up, the version 2, the traffic manager that was pointing me to the old website said, OK, I'm going to cut that connection, and I'm going to point you to this one. So I pretty much did a, not, not a beep swap on the fly, but you know, redirected it to a different one. So this is how you can actually ma manage uh, upgrade of your infra, website, or whatever services you're providing on the fly. So you can take one down, upgrade that one, eventually point it to that one, disable the other guys, and upgrade them as well. So that's one way of doing it. Now, let me guide you through the release definition. Now we know what happened. Let's work out how that happened. So we can do that with slots also, right? Yes, but app slots, they don't, so you have to have someone to configure that for you, right? And you, you could do a VIP swap. What I've done here, I migrated my website from Australia in the United States. And I didn't know what location it's going to come up. It's either. Uh, United States, so it's West US, North Europe, which is in Ireland, or was it Japan West? So these were my locations. Um, and I'm going to come to that part in a minute. So let's have a look at the release definition. So we figured out that the build process doesn't do anything dramatic. It just you know, creates the, the package that contains my website and so forth. OK, so let's have a look at what release does. So when I hit Edit, what, I'm, what, a, what I was expecting was probably a task in there, maybe two. One is to deploy the website, and the other one maybe just you know, hit the, the endpoint so that I do some you know, um, warm up. Now, when I see this guy, it has 19 tasks. Does that scare you? It's quite a lot. So, OK, let's go through one by one. So we have, well, Twitter is going mental. So <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. Um, so that's that deploy traffic manager. That's uh, one of the steps. And the first one is to deploy the global Azure storage. And I'm going to come back to that guy uh, a bit later. But that traffic manager is a component that wasn't living in my Azure DevOps domain um, resource group. So by the way, how many of you have tried Azure before? OK, half the room. That's great. So ha do you know what Azure resource groups are? OK, good. For, for those of you who have never tried this, in Azure, you can create any resource you like, which means you can create a website, you can create a SQL server, you can create you name it. There are so many components there available. Now, the way you can structure them, and this is what the, the approach has been for the past two, maybe three years, is to have containers, like, but not Docker containers. It's like boxes. And in those boxes, you say, OK, I want to have these type of resources that kind of form my service or my application. And I want to have them in a resource group. You can actually have an app spreading across multiple gr uh, resource groups. It's totally up to you. The reason why I have this one is because it's global. So the, the Azure DevOps domain contains some resources that are global to my domain. And that's why I keep them separate from the rest of it. Now, my website. Um, specifically, has a few resources. And there's the website, there's the default app service plan, which allows me to host my website. There's a SQL server, and there's a website. Now, if I hit refresh here, 
you will see that I have another group here, DDD Sydney version 2. I'm going to come that, to that back um, as well. But this one contains my newer version of the, the website, and it has a few different components. So it has a default S1 uh, service plan, it has Key Vault, um, it has SQL Server, and has my website and my database. So how did I get to the stage? Because before, I didn't have that. Um, this DDD Sydney V1 was hosting my first website, and now all of a sudden I have another website that is actually the live website, and the other one doesn't do anything. Normally I would take it down, but for the you know sake of demo, uh, I just kept it up running. So going back here, that traffic manager was deployed through an ARM template, and you're going to see a bit later what ARM templates are. Uh, but all it does for me, it deploys that component the DDD in the Azure DevOps domain group. It de de deployed that traffic manager with no endpoints. Nothing was there, it was just an empty traffic manager. That's what the first step of the release definition was. Then when I deployed that, every deployment to Azure has inputs and outputs. And let me show you what those inputs and outputs look like. So if I go to deployments, so everything you do when you say, I want to create a new website, that's a deployment. Even if you do it through the UI, it doesn't matter. It's going to come up like this. So when I look at this guy, Traffic Manager, um, you will see that I have some inputs. And I specify what's my domain name, what's my subdomain name, and what's the TTL. Now, the reason why I kept TTL to 10 seconds is just because I want to you know, quickly regenerate those things. But what I care about from now on, I want to use that Traffic Manager uh, name and uh, the endpoint, so the, the URI where it points to, actually that's misspelled but it doesn't matter. I want to use that somewhere else in my deployment. So if I want to you know, get those endpoints up and running so that my website doesn't go down, I need to know where am I redirecting it to. So there's a custom task in this process which says get ARM outputs. Uh, you can get that from Marketplace if you want to. But what the task actually does for me, it goes to, um, to, this deployment, uh, to this resource group and it looks for the last successful deployment. And because you know I just deployed uh, the traffic manager, it's going to grab, OK, that's the last deployment, and it's going to give me those outputs back. OK? The reason why I need those outputs is because the next thing I do in the process, I set the endpoints. So my website that was pointing to um, sorry, my domain that was pointing to that Azure website has to be updated. And I'm going to update the DNS record on the fly as soon as I get the traffic manager. Now, because I don't want to you know, pe leave people hanging up in the air, I, I need an endpoint. And that's what I do here uh, with some custom PowerShell. Uh, a few other steps down here. So set VSTS variables. It just you know, creates some things for me. Um, it works out what resource group I'm deploying to. So this is quite an interesting approach. So let's say you're doing major changes to your infrastructure, right? When do you know you're going to go um, to a new, completely new resource group, or where, where do you want to keep deploying to an existing one? How would you do that? Ideas. OK, one possibility is that we you know, introduce a flag in release procedure and we say, is that a new deployment or not? And that would you know, trigger a new resource group and so forth. But what if you have to keep repeating that? Like you, know, you go another major version up and you want to have the whole process automated. Well, probably the best approach is use semantic, uh, semantic versioning. And every time you bump up the major version, uh, you spin up a new resource group, otherwise you just keep updating the existing one. And that's what I've done here with my uh, set VSTS variables. What it does for me, it looks at, hold on, where's that? Here. Remember that the build that we had here is version 2.0.0 plus whatever the, the change set was after that? The previous deployment was version 1. So when I go and check back, um, I search for every resource group that starts with DDD Sydney. 
so I have a tag somewhere in uh, resource groups that I know, you know, how many versions do I have? I can keep running, you know, five versions. I could have v1, v2, v3, v4, and so forth. So I look at the, the, the latest deployment and I work out, is my deployment, the current version number, higher than what I have there as the highest number? If yes, then spin up a new version. If not, then deploy into the existing one. So that's how I can, you know, spin up. If I created another build, version 3, I would have DDD Sydney uh, dash v3. If not, I can keep deploying to the existing one, right? So you don't want to create new resources on the fly unless you have to. Uh, and that's one way how you can do that. Now then we come to a deploy key vault. Okay. Where do you keep your secrets at the moment? Do you store, how many of you will store that in uh, web config? Okay. A few. How many of you put that in release management or octopus deploy? Okay, that's scary. How many huh? How many of you are using something like Key Vault? Okay, a few. How many of you manually change the secrets when you deploy? Okay. Where do you keep your secrets then? Only one says Key Vault. Okay. Now to explain what Key Vault is and the reason why I used it. Um, if you want to keep secrets somewhere that are safe, <coughs> you can use Release Management. It gives you a nice tab like this one. Um, ah, here's Release. So if I go to Variables, I can keep my variables here and they are quite secure. But the problem is somebody ha has to enter that you know, secret in there. Is it me? Sysadmin doesn't matter. Someone has to do it. If I isolate myself from having secrets somewhere in my release pipeline, and I can store them in a centralized place like Key Vault in Azure, that means that every time I make a deployment, I can get those secrets and I can use them to deploy my website on the, uh, on the fly. With the secrets that are stored somewhere else and I have no idea what they are. All I need to know is that these secrets run my website. How cool is that? Yeah? Okay. Would it be even better if I tell you that, you know, once you have Key Vault up and running, and this is where my Key Vault lives. It's in the DDD uh, Sydney dash V2. That's my Key Vault. And that key vault has some secrets in there. But as soon as I hit secrets, you're going to see that I don't have permission to see those secrets. So only a person who has access to that key vault can you know, retrieve those secrets back, no one else. And of course, the ARM templates, uh, when I specify that those ARM templates have access to this guy. Now, obviously, I can go here and override those changes. Um, but that's the only you know, person, that, and it's not a person, it's an app. Um, it's a different approach, but it doesn't matter. If I add myself here, I can go there and check that secret. Um, so let's just wait for me to come up. So I'm going to say I'm going to have full permission to secret. I'm going to save that. And now if I go here. I should be able, there we go, there's my SQL Azure password. So as a principle, I was able to see that and I can see what's the current version. If, and if I updated that secret, I could see what's the next one. But you know, the tool itself doesn't need to know what the secret is. It can just link to the latest one and it can say grab whatever is there and use that for deployment. Now obviously I can reveal that secret. So when I go and I say show secret, that's something that I didn't, you know, produce. So that was generated for me. Now, when you said that it's cool that you can keep secrets somewhere in a different place, how cool would it be if you can rotate that secret with every deployment without breaking anything? Have you tried that before? Any secret rotation? No? All right, the reason why secret rotation is so important. Imagine, you know, having a super secure password, but everyone has access to that one. Eventually, that can get compromised. Want it or not, it can, right? If you rotate those secrets every now and then, there's a possibility, if you do that manually, that things will, you know, break because of that. Like, you know, <coughs> changing a SQL Server um, 
username or password will break things. But what if that can be automated to the extent wherever you're making a deployment, you don't break anything? And this is what I'm doing here. So the next step in my release definition, um, after I get the secrets back, is to re re uh, sorry, after I get the outputs from the latest deployment. Uh, I, I have one question. So uh, in that ARM um, uh, deployment task, you have uh, something as an output variable, so you can specify and it will give you the outputs. That's right, yeah. So, it, but so the question. But you need a separate task every time you need the outputs. Of course, because it's a different group, different deployment. It's the latest deployment, so don't the forget. Same, the same task that does the deployment can also output these through some uh, variables. I don't think VSTS gives you that. Yeah, I have done that. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. So the comment was, so every time you make a deployment, you don't need this guy here. Um, this one should capture the. There is the output uh, variable somewhere. I don't remember seeing that, but uh, definitely something worth looking into. So the comment was, um, I don't necessarily have to call get outputs every single time, because this task apparently gives me that functionality. And it's a very good feedback. I didn't know about that. I mean, I've been used to this approach for, for so long, because the SDS task didn't give me that. So that I kept calling, OK, get, get me the outputs. But one way or the other, you need those outputs, because you carry them forward to, to the next task that does certain things. So now we come to that secrets rotation. There's some um, super smart PowerShell script in there, as you can see. right? So it pulls the um, alphanumeric signs plus a few random characters. The reason why I did it that way, you have to be careful when you're setting up connection strings. So if you generate your password on the fly, and if it accidentally generates double quotes, Imagine how nice that is in the connection string, right? It just <laughs> cuts it at that point, and the entire deployment will fail because of that. Um, then this guy sets some parameters for me, because I'm using a, another um, parameters file that runs my deployment. Yeah, there's a question. I was just going to say, um, if you've got the rotating key vaults, uh, if you're deploying a new key vault, the new key vault that's deployed, does it have the history of the previous password for prior deployments? Or only for that deployment? If I'm deploying in, so the question was, if I'm deploying Key Vault, does that keep history of what the previous passwords were, or previous secrets, or not? Yes, as long as I'm deploying in the existing group, I can keep that data. If I'm deploying in a new group, then I would have to back up the data and restore it. But I don't do that here in this demo. The reason being is because I'm generating that secret on the fly. I don't care about the history. So Key Vault gives me that out of, out of the box, but I don't need that. All I care about is the current password. But I could do that if I want, yeah. OK, so this sets some uh, parameters for me. So knowing what the resource group is going to be and a few other things. I'm going to come to that file um, in a few minutes. Um, then moving on. ARM templates, the way they are designed, so ARM templates are JSON files. And you're going to see later on what exactly uh, you have to put in there. But the beauty about ARM templates is that you can link them. So I can have a master template saying, I want you to deploy a website, and I want you to deploy the, the database. And when you say, I have two templates now inside the master one, they're linked. They're completely different files. And those two files can say, I want you to deploy SQL Server, and I want you to deploy the database separately. So there are another two in there. So eventually, I have a few more files. I, it can be a chain. Actually, it can be um, a cluster, w what I have in there. And um, if I want ARM to deploy that for me, link templates, they have to be available somewhere publicly on a publicly available <coughs> URL, which means I have an option. Either I deploy that to GitHub um, or somewhere else. What I chose is Azure. And when I'm deploying to Azure, I know that that you know, URL that um, I'm going to have, I can use it later on for my deployment. So whatever I store in Azure, I can have version sec um, scripts in there and version templates. I'm just going to point ARM template, the, the parent one, to those guys, and everything is going to work for me. So that's in a nutshell what it happens. Then the final bit is to deploy the website infrastructure. And what this guy um, does for me, it will deploy everything else but the um, 
uh, the key vault. So it deploys the app service plan, it deploys the SQL server, and it deploys the app service. It also deploys an empty database. Now, the question being is, as you remember, this website still has the data. So how did the data get back there if I copied, well, if I created a new database? I have another task in my script, and that's this one down here, that copies over the existing database. So if we look at um, the DD Sydney version one, there is a website there, and I know what my previous database was. So all I have to do is I have to find it in Azure, take a copy, move it across, and then that's it. My data is going to be there. I attach it back to the right SQL server, and that's going to work for me. So if I move on to that release definition, then a few final steps. I tag the deployment group. So next time I'm deploying, I need to know what my version number is and what, um, how to discover my resource group next time. So I have that rolling deployment in place. And all it does, if you look at tags, this is my previous version. This is the discovery name. So if I want to deploy, I want to first work out how many resource groups do I have, what's the latest version, and I'm going to deploy to that one. So this guy, V2, has exactly the same discovery name, but different version number. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <coughs> so now finally, I have to set those secrets that I generated on the fly. By the way, when this deploys, um, where is the task? To this guy here, deploy website infrastructure, is actually linked back to my key vault. Remember, when I'm deploying SQL Server and I'm changing the secrets, I need to change the secret on SQL, uh, SQL Server as well. Otherwise, the whole deployment is going to fail. Eventually, it might be like, yo, SQL Server password is this, but what I provided in a connection string is different. And if the two of them don't match, there, there won't be any um, connection between the two of them. So when I'm deploying the website, I'm linking SQL Server back to my secrets, which means that now the rotation is actually fully operational. So whatever I generated is what I use. And any website that was potentially having access to this one, if it wasn't part of my deployment, it's going to be blocked just because of that sequence. So finally, I deploy the website. Um, and that website is going to have the right connection string. So if I go <laughs> here. So that's my website. It has been configured to run on a custom domain. But what I want to show you is what is in app settings. So let's go to console. OK. And if I type out what my app settings, the JSON is, you're going to see that this is my connection string. This is my server. That's the newly created server. And it does spit out uh, the password as well. This is hard coded here. But no one else, except people who have access to this website, would be able to reveal that information. So that makes that website super secure. And also, it sets down my website location. And that comes back from what data center did I choose when I was running my deployment. So that's how we, we ended up having United States up there. So the final few bits down here, are, you know, once I have my website up and running, the database is there, the website is there. All I have to do is to cut the connection on the first one and redirect it to the right guy. So this is when I update my traffic endpoint, uh, traffic manager endpoints, and then I set the custom domain to point to the uh, ddd.sydney.azuredevops.xyz. So, how do you like red color now? It's incredible how much work was there in the back to, to get a simple change up and running. The reason why I showed it, you know, it, it looks like a simple change, but what I've done in the back 
is an incredibly powerful thing. And that is not something that is a myth. It's something you guys can do today if you want to. And it's something what is going to be the next stage of DevOps. People keep moving in that space. I'm working for a client at the moment uh, where we're doing a lot of this work, way more complex than what you've seen today. And it's super exciting. And the main advantage here is, first of all, you can save the costs because you can spin up the infrastructure as needed. Um, you can create resources as you like on the fly. And a, f and a few other reasons would be everyone, if you want to do it like super secure enterprise DevOps, you don't want random people to have admin access to your cloud, right? You want only a few. But what if your sysadmin died yesterday? How would you get there? Right? So now we can go back to our slides. So let me just jump across. I have a question. Yep. Try to be this one. So it deploys like, so once you uh, deploy the next version, right, then it spin up new uh, resources and everything. But when you want to deploy, like, which means uh, when you want to move between staging and production, what would you do there? Okay, so the question was, I'm doing everything on the fly now, but if I wanted to move from uh, staging to production, what would I do there? It's an interesting question. So first of all, do you need that staging environment at all times? Is the yes. question yes or no? Yes, for testing purposes, right? So, uh, do you need it during the night? Pardon? Do you need it during the night? Not night time, but during the daytime. Why, for you the Why would you be paying for the night time for, of that resource? I can give you an example of what we're doing for, one, for, for that client. How many of you have heard about HD Insights? Big data. OK, a few. So big data in Azure is super expensive thing. It costs 6 to $10 an, per hour. Per hour, not per month like you know a few other things do. So running that resource overnight becomes super expensive, especially if you do it you know, for the whole month, let alone for the whole year. So what do we do? We spin up that infrastructure on the fly. I think it's about 6 a.m. In two hours, when they come in, everything is pretty much processed, and then we turn it off. And we, we pay only for those two hours that you know, it was processing the data. But for the rest of the day, you know, we keep the resources down. So we can you know, store the database somewhere in Azure, and we, keep, we have to pay for that resource, but that, that's you know, something you can't um, avoid. But compute is the most expensive resource in any cloud. So why would you be paying for that? And now back to your question. If your staging environment is not needed at all times, you can turn it off if you want to. You can keep it running. There, there's no problem. I mean, you can have the classic deployment pipeline where you say, I want to you know, have three-tier environment, dev test staging, or sorry, dev staging production, and that's OK. But if you get yourself out of the box and you look at it, I don't have any infrastructure. How do I get there? This is where this gets exciting. So if you lock down Azure portal like we did with the other client, no one has write access. They cannot create resources there. They can only you know, see what's going on. But they, 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 they're making changes through code. And this is where things get exciting. So I'm um, going to explain a few more things. But I'm going to um, come back to your question later on. So what, what is the Azure Resource Manager, ARM? I've been talking about ARM, ARM, ARM all the time. But that stands for Azure Resource Manager. It's nothing but a JSON file with a lot of complexity, if I can say so. So there are four main categories of that one. So the first one, or sections, whatever you like it. The first one is parameters. This is where you define, if you have like um, a generalized template that creates your website, you can choose, I want to have a super fast service plan, I want to have a cheap one, and so forth. And that would come from parameters, where you say everything is standardized, but I, I just want to have you know little variations. The next thing is variables. Variables help you. Um, enhance certain things inside, like you know, if you want to concatenate a few strings and form a URL or something like that, um, that's where you would probably use variables you know, to, to enhance your input parameters. 
Now the next thing is resources, and this is the, the main driver of the, the deployment, where you specify, I want to have a <coughs> database, I want to have a SQL Server, and I want to have a website. And each one of these three is a resource for itself. And uh, the way you specify it is like in a nice and clean structure. You, you say, OK, I want to have a SQL Azure. I want to have App Service. These are my properties. That's where my URL is, so to, to pull down the, the deployment file and so forth. And the final bit is the output. So going back, when I said that I can have inputs to my deployment and I have outputs, this is where I specify what do I want to get back from my ARM template. So if I need that information for future steps, this is exactly where I would specify it. So inside, you know, you can see that there, there's not real JSON values. There are like functions, and those are ARM template functions which you, you can write on the fly. There are a few tools that help you, you know, do um, IntelliSense. So they provide you IntelliSense, and you can, you know, easily code those files, otherwise it can become quite painful. Now the other thing that I didn't really touch is PowerShell. So half of that website that I um, created was done through, an, through ARM templates, but a few bits and bobs were done through PowerShell. Both ways are pretty good. Um, the reason where PowerShell becomes super nice is where you want to, you know, control the flow of how things are generated rather than rely on the, the th template that does everything for you. And template is great because you know it, it can be reproduced anytime you want. You just specify different parameters. Whereas here, I can control the flow. Like and this guy copy database is a good example. I need to know I need to get the old uh, database. If there's an existing one in the cloud, I want to remove it. And an R template won't do that for me. Um, and then I just specify, get, get a copy of that database from that place and put it into a new SQL Server. Now the question is where to start. So if you haven't done any of this before, you've seen what is possible. If you want to start with that, well, probably the best thing to do is to talk with your sysadmin first. Because that's a major change for everyone who, who hasn't done that before. So to get him on, he, on your side, probably the best thing to do is to put your infrastructure code in a different repo and get your sysadmin learn what ARM templates are and you know probably they know PowerShell already which means that then they can make pull pretty much review pull requests and work out well that's a change I want to have and that's a change I don't and that's how they now control what is happening with your infrastructure rather than them making changes. It's a completely, you know, mind shift, but it's a very powerful one. So now you can say, yeah, my team is a proper DevOps team where sysadmin is working with me. Um, a few other tricks. So if you haven't done any of this before, you can go to any of the resource groups and you can click on the automation script. And that's going to give you an ARM template of what's in there. And you can work it backwards, how to construct ARM templates. You can try to deploy this, whatever it's going to give you. Uh, there's a download button uh, on the top. Don't expect it to work. Because what ARM, well, this automation script will give you is what is there. But if my deployment relies on a secret, it's not going to reveal that secret for you. And often it will give you information that it's not needed there and so forth. So it's a great place to learn. It's not something I'll be using for real deployments. It's something you have to just work it backwards, how it was constructed, and it's a good head start. Also, it's great to click on that link, learn, about, uh, learn more about the template deployment, which is going to take you to one of those pages. Um, one is about what's the best practices to create ARM templates. Yeah? Okay, so, so the question was, do the, so when you go to the automation script, does that occur only on the resource group level or does it that happen on the um, components? You can click on the components, but it's going to take you back to the resource group. So you can't all get just a single thing out. You're going to see everything in there. So yeah. <coughs> 
Um, the other place to, to visit is the deploy template. Um, sorry. There's a PowerShell page um, in Azure documentation that gives you so pretty much everything you create through an ARM template, you can create it through a PowerShell script. It's your choice what you're going to use. Often it's going to be probably a bit of both. Um, so now we come to the tools. What tools are best to use? So first of all, Visual Studio Code is definitely the best co free coding tool that you can get not only for ARM templates or PowerShell, but for, for many other things. And it's absolutely fantastic for PowerShell if you install a few extensions. So there's one you know, by, provided by Microsoft. Uh, it gives you the same debug experience as you would get, well, not in Visual Studio, but it's close to that. It gives you variables you can you know, go through. Um, the entire graph of what you know your objects are and so forth. If you're using PowerShell ISE, it's nowhere near what you can get here. The other one is Azure Resource Manager um, extension. This one will help <laughs> you handcraft the templates because it, all those functions that I was showing to you, they are available in IntelliSense, and you can use that one that will. Um, you know, g give you all those options, what you can put in different places. It also knows the JSON schema, so it predicts what can, ha can go into certain parameters. And it will, you know, block you from doing things and gives you nice uh, IntelliSense and error highlighting and so forth. All of that is for free. And finally, you know, cloud is your best friend here. If you're using private cloud, you can use PowerShell DSC, desired state configuration, which can do certain things for you. But cloud like Azure is definitely the best thing you can get these days to, to play with infrastructure as code. And if cloud is your best friend, Visual Studio Team Services is probably the best platform that will get you there with, you know, with a nice ride. So, what you've seen today, it's my super cool, the next trip advisor. Now looking back at that website, it was super cool blue, and I didn't like blue. I definitely prefer this red. I think it's way better color, because it involves some <coughs> pain, but it's also exciting. So you have seen, you know, we went through what stages of DevOps you are today. You have seen quite a few things you can do in there. Uh, I shared a few tips and tricks, and we've you know, done quite a nice demo on the next stage of DevOps. So there were a few questions already, but I have one for you. Given that you've seen what the blue color gives you and what the red one gives you, which one do you like more, blue or red? Thank you.